this is Memorial Weekend, with Memorial Day being a decoration day, being celebrated tomorrow. And for many here in Indy, Memorial Day means what? Race Day. <laughs> but we all know that it is a day established, well, I don't know if we all know this, but it was established in 1868 to honor and remember and decorate the graves of all those who have lost their lives as members of our armed forces. I know I said I'd be in John all the way till I went to Malta, but decided that we were going to stop and have a Memorial Day uh, sermon. Uh, and you know, we were just at Gabe's uh, commissioning ceremony, and I, I found this out that less than 13% of all Americans have ever served in the armed forces. And uh, we have so, so many men and women who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom. Memorial and Webster is something that keeps memory alive. We need to thank the American soldier for the price that they paid on behalf of our freedom and those around the world. And we should stop and say thank you to them, right? We want to thank those in the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines and the Coast Guard and all of those who have served. I believe it is good that we keep alive the memory of those who died so that we might enjoy ourselves, that we are right now, the freedom and the prosperity we have in America today, blessed by the Lord. And thousands have paid the ultimate price for things many here in America take for granted. Isn't that true? You know, when you, uh, you, you, when you think of our fallen soldiers and the families, there's, uh, such a price has been paid. By them, and, and we're grateful. In Washington, D.C., there stands a monument. It's a memorial to the Vietnam veterans who lost their lives in that controversial war. The memorial is all black, in stark contrast to all the white marble buildings around it. And when it was first unveiled, it was not well received. People didn't like it at all. It was considered ugly, it was considered hideous. But today, it's highly prized, and it's very respected. Its utter simplicity is its beauty. It just lists the names of those who fought and died, and in doing so, makes an all overall powerful statement, doesn't it? And if you've been to Washington, D.C., you should look at that memorial. Well, today we're going to look at Hebrews 11. So please turn there, and we're looking at the Winning the big war, where we are all called to duty. In Hebrews 11, we're going to see something very similar. We see God's memorial, a listing of veterans in another war, a great spiritual war, the war between heaven and the war between hell. And that's really what it's all about. Righteousness and wickedness, faith and fear, God's way or man's way. We too are part of this war. Where all of us are called to duty. This is the big war that matters for all of eternity. The names of 16 post people are carved into this memorial. And many others are referred to. But they're not named. And as in any war, the cost of victory was very high. The sacrifice of self. Even to the point of death. The issue is always freedom, and it is still freedom. Freedom from enslavement to sin, and freedom from this world and its ways that are so opposed by Satan, that are so opposed to the Lord, that are opposed to God and His Word. In Hebrews 11, the author gives us examples, and we're going to look at those today, of how faith enabled Ordinary people, not extraordinary, but ordinary people to experience victory in this big war. To experience victory in their daily battles of life to the large battles. So stay here with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this day. We thank you for those in our nation who have not only fought for our freedom, but for the freedom of many others around the world. Lord, through your sovereignty, we are blessed. Lord, we pray that as a nation, we turn back to you and that we serve you wholeheartedly, that we 
proclaim you and glorify you. We pray as a church that we do that here, that we serve you and please you in all we do. May we give you all the glory and honor you rightfully deserve. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In Hebrews 11, the author gives us examples of how faith enabled ordinary people to experience victory in this big war. So this morning I want us to see four characteristics of faith that will enable us to win the big war. This is to overcome the world and live victoriously for the Lord right here, right now in your daily life. We need to have a vision of God. We need to make a decision for God. And we need to take action for God. And we have to be people with devotion to God. So first, let's see the context of Hebrews 11. The author here is writing to converts from Judaism who were in danger of giving up the faith and going back to the spiritual slavery that they were of the law. And that's what's going on here. And if you go back to chapter 10, verse 32, they started well, suffering much and even joyfully, it says, for the gospel in their earlier days, it states. It says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. But now it has become a battle to go on to, in verse 36, to persevere in doing the will of God, it states, until he comes. It's becoming a battle for them. To hang in and stay spiritually tough. To be true to the Lord no matter the pressures and continue to persevere and, verse 38 in chapter 10, live by faith. To encourage them, the author, I believe the Apostle Paul, gives examples of how faith enabled ordinary people to experience great victory in their life. Perhaps this morning you are struggling. You don't want to go on. Doing the will of God seems to accomplish nothing except to bring more grief in your life. Or maybe the earlier days of joyfully sacrificing and even suffering for the Lord are but memories as the long haul has set in, as the trials have come. And you know, there is always the pressure from this world that we face each and every day, the flesh and the devil, to shrink back. And that's what Paul is talking to him about in verse 38 of chapter 10. To shrink back from persevering in the walk of the faith, from continuing to do the will of God, no matter what, no matter the cost. But as Paul said to Timothy, I want to encourage you to, 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. But you know, let me encourage you this morning that by the faith of these war heroes, we can take uh, encouragement from that in our own life. So let's look at these four characteristics of the faith that transcend time and transcend circumstances to them, apply to them, to us today. We're going to incorporate these four characteristics that we will have a desire to incorporate into our life, and you will take your rightful place of Mo- just alongside of Moses, Noah, Abraham, and David as a faith hero and experience victory right now in your life in this big war. Who wants to be a faith hero for Jesus Christ in your life? Yeah, amen. To win the big war, you must first have a vision of God. Is this something like, hmm, mental imaging? Or believing that what the mind can perceive, one can achieve. Is that, is that the type of vision? No, that's not what we're talking about. Faith, faith's vision is what Jacob in uh, Hebrews 11.21, and you go back to Genesis 27.1, had though his eyes were dim with age. Remember that? And what Samson in Hebrews 11.32 had when he had no eyes at all in his story, that you can read his whole story in Judges 16.21. Remember when he was blind. Hebrews 11.1 says, Faith is being what? Certain of what we do not see. It is being sure of what we hope for. This faith gives assurance to our hopes and makes us certain of realities 
which are beyond our physical senses, okay? This faith believes and sees with the heart what God has revealed and promises to those who obey and follow him, no matter what. No matter what's going on in your life. It's a no matter what. Biblical faith is a response to revelation. It is trusting God's revealed word and God's revealed will. In Romans 10, 17, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. This faith, what's it do? It lays hold of God's revealed word. It claims it as certain and begins to live in anticipation of it. This faith gives one a goal. This faith gives one a purpose. This faith gives one a destination in this life and beyond. These faith heroes, these ordinary men, these ordinary women, they look beyond the immediate trials. They looked beyond the immediate troubles of their life and interpreted them in terms of the future. You see that? They had their, look at verse 36 in chapter 10. They had their eyes upon the rich reward to come when they would receive what God had promised in verse 36. You go over to Hebrews 11, 6, it says, He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. It says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Look at verse 10, Hebrews 11.10. And this vision, when looked forward to a city whose architect and builder is God, it says in Hebrews 11.13 and 14, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Ah, there's a napkin left. (laughs) I'm going to have to make sure I start stocking up. (laughs) Do you see that, though? They hadn't received what they'd promised in this life. Many were still living by faith when they died. And though they did not see all the promise of God fulfilled in their lifetime, they, with faith's vision, what's it say? Saw them from a distance and welcomed them. They were looking for, thinking about, and even longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Verse 16, look at those words. Looking, thinking, longing for a better country, a heavenly home. In uh, verse 16. And what was the result of that? Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Verse 16. Amen to that, right? Hebrews eleven twenty six. you can look there. Moses could suffer mistreatment and resist the short-time pleasures of sin. It says, because he was looking ahead to his reward. He was seeing him who is invisible. This faith is a result of accepting what God has said about the future as surely as we accept what he has said concerning the past. In in verse 3 of uh, Hebrews, chapter 11. When you are a person of faith, your horizons that are not dominated by this world, but by your vision of God and his promises are good. You see that? To win this big war, we see what? We first must have a proper vision of God. Secondly, you must be a person of decision for God. When you have faith's vision of God, who has called you, right? When you see where you are going, you must then make a decision in life based upon that vision. You have to have the right vision to make the right decision. To live by faith, you must say, I am going to live now in light of the future, and that future which I am certain of, okay? This involves choosing to obey the Lord. Look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He followed his ways. And that's what we need to do, follow his ways, heed his will, 
no matter how difficult it is in life, and no matter what the cost is. Do you guys agree with that? We have seen this over and over and over in the Word of God. Christian living, living by faith, involves making right choices. It involves making right decisions. Holiness is making the right decision. Carnality, right, is making the wrong decision. It's that simple. There are always choices to be made in our life. To sin or to not sin. To read the Word of God or to not read the Word of God. To go along with the world or not go along with the world. To love your wife as you ought or not love her as you ought. To submit to your husband as you should or not. A child to obey his parents or not. To watch that movie or to not watch that movie. To listen to that song or what? What do our eyes see? We've talked about these things. Everything is a decision and a choice. And we've seen this over and over. So we should what? It says in verse 32, 1032, stand your ground to have your will done for the Lord, etc. I'm going to stand my ground to make a decision to serve Jesus Christ in every aspect of my life. And this stand your ground mentality is not one of not being tolerant in love, but one that says, I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what the cost in faith. This always involves some form of sacrifice in your life because you cannot have, the Bible tells us, both God and the world. Hebrews 11.4, look at it. Abel's decision, it cost him his life. It says, by faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Look at verse 5. Enoch's decision, it cost him the popularity of his peers and caused him to walk alone in a desperately wicked world. It says in verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleases God. Look down at verse 23. Moses' decision cost him the wealth of Egypt. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And then we know that Moses went on into great wealth. Hebrews 11.26, look at that, is characteristic. This is characteristic of those who live by faith. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Because he was looking ahead to his reward. Do you see that vision he had? He was looking ahead and he made a right decision. They chose God because they see the unseen. One of the simplest facts about men and women of faith is that they bring eternity to bear upon the everyday decisions of life. Do you hear that? They they bring eternity to bear on every choice they make. What does God want? What pleases the Lord? What pleases my Savior, Jesus Christ? What will glorify Him? What will bring honor to Him? We call this here at ECGBC what? Living in light of eternity, right? We can't just use that as a slogan. We need to use that as a banner in our life, that we live in light of eternity as we have a proper vision of God and decide and choose to obey Him. But you know, faith doesn't always equate, you know, biblical faith, with moving mountains. We often think that you have to move big mountains. It doesn't always do that. Let's look on. Look at verse 4. By faith, Abel did what? He did something monumental? No. Earth-shattering? No. He just decided to offer up the sacrifice that God commanded him to offer up. He did what God wanted him to do. In verse 5, Enoch, he had a supernatural exit out of this world, but does it say God told him in advance that it would happen? No. And in faith uh, that he believed? No. It says before, there's the word, before he was taken, Enoch simply decided to live a life that pleased God. Not himself or the world, but we can't overlook those words, to please God. Genesis 5.24 says he walked with God in a day when when his world wanted to have nothing to do with God. 
It doesn't matter where we get in this life. It doesn't matter where we get in society. It doesn't matter what happens in our country. No matter if it gets worse or if a revival comes. Whatever God's will is, it's that we walk with God no matter what. This is something every believer can do by faith. And by the way, at any moment, God could come in the rapture and take us up out of here just like he did Enoch. Do you believe that? Amen. And then when we see Jesus Christ for the first time face to face, we shall be so thankful that he will say, well done, my good and what? Faithful servant. Faithful servant. The bottom line is this. To win this spiritual war, you must come to the point where you decide to win it. One of the charges leveled against the Vietnam War was that America or our politicians were not in it to win it. And that cannot be anything involved in our spiritual warfare. We must be in it to win it spiritually. We must be in it to win it intentionally. Every aspect of our life. We have churches with far too many Christians today in them who profess to believe in Christ, hope in heaven, yet have have, uh, decided to walk with God, to please Him at any cost, and yet don't live it. So many haven't decided to get serious about their faith. Christians who haven't decided to have victory over sin and victory over the world. That's not where God wants any Christian to be. Who haven't decided to read and master the word of God. That's not where God wants you. He wants to spend time with you and fellowship with you. And who haven't decided to faithfully worship God at church or witness to a dying world. That's not what our Lord wants. He wants us to be sold out for him. Worshiping him. Giving him all the glory. And being obedient to him in all things. You see... This type of attitude within the overwhelming church today must stop. We must come back to a fervor and a heart-deep desire to say, I have a proper vision of my God, and I'm going to make the decisions in my life that mirror God's Word. Not how I feel, not what I want, but what does God want of me? What is God calling me to do? To win this big war, you must not only be a person of vision and decision, but we must be a people of action for God. Action, you know, it takes on many forms. You know, when you look at our soldiers in the military, it, not all of them are in the front lines. Not all of them are special forces. Not all of them are SEALs. Some of them are in the reserve. Some, some of them are in the National Guard. Some of them are in the rear. Some of them are in supply. They all have a role to play. Action takes on many forms. It could be stopping to pray. It could be growing your prayer life. It could be edifying a brother or sister. It could be encouraging another. It could be going the extra mile for somebody. It could be serving in the church or serving in the community. It could be just obeying God and where he has you in your life. And it could be fellowshipping with the saints. It can go on. There's many forms of action. But here's what we know. Faith always acts. Faith always acts. It is always doing something in view of the future and it's always doing something in view of the promises of God. How many never win the battle because they say I believe and I have decided to follow Jesus but they just never get around to it. Visionaries without action, they're just dreamers and resolution without action is rubbish. That is all it is. They make people feel good but accomplish very little. People who go with feelings over the truth have the caboose at the front where the engine should be. The engine needs to be the truth, and the caboose needs to be your feelings, everybody. Feelings are lies. Not always. I feel love for Shannon. That's truth. But you know what I mean. The the feelings of the world. God creates feelings, and they're good. Joy, love, Peace, comfort, all of these things we feel that are godly, that are in God's word, are okay. You have to match them up against the world, and do they equate? Every example of faith in this chapter is one of action. Men and women set to work out their faith. 
Faith is not passive. Faith is dynamic, okay? Faith is dynamic. It's not a passive thing in one's life. Noah didn't say, I believe there is a coming judgment of rain, and I have decided to build an ark and preach to the world, and then did nothing, did he? Abraham responded to the promises and call of God, remember, even though it said he did not know where he was going, nor what those next steps would be in his life. He still stepped out and acted in faith. And you see, much of the time in our lives, in our personal lives, and in our personal experiences in life, we're not going to see the future very well. We're not going to know what the next step is very often. But much of our faith walk in this life is not knowing, but it shouldn't be not doing. Okay? It shouldn't be not doing. Up to verse 33, the word by faith is just one word used 20 times. 20 times. It's used by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. You get it? But in verse 33, another word is added, and it is translated through faith, meaning by means of faith, pointed to the power of faith, which actually does something by the power of God, through God working in your life. Look at all the action verbs in verse 32 through 33. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and uh, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. Look at this action in verse 33. They administered justice, or the NASD says, they performed acts of righteousness. You know, it is easy enough to condemn sin and even the world in verse 7. But start promoting righteousness. Start promoting justice in your school. Start promoting obedience in your church. Start promoting godly living in your workplace. Start promoting righteousness and holy living in your neighborhood. And watch the sparks start to fly around you. The point is faith acts. And it's very action. It, it turns weakness to strength. Because in and of ourselves, we are weak. We know that. Look at verse 34. It quenched the fire, the uh, fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. You see, God will empower you with strength, and God will empower you with courage. Do you remember what he told Joshua at the beginning? Be strong and courageous. God will empower you with wisdom and his grace. You never knew you had when you decide to act on what you believe and on what God says and what God promises, and he will give you the power and the resources. Amen? Let's not be people in our lives who say, I believe God can do anything in my life, and then refuse to do anything saying, God can't use me. I can't overcome this sinful habit. I can't overcome this sinful attitude. I can't be a witness, not me. Let's, let's not be tricked into believing things like that. Or let's not be a people who say, we believe we are but aliens and strangers on earth, verse 13 of Hebrews 11, and then take no action to lay up our treasures in heaven, like we're commanded. Or who say, we believe in the power of prayer, and then take no action to make prayer a staple of our lives. Or to say that my loved ones or my friends or my peers or neighbors and strangers are going to hell without Jesus and then take no action to witness to that. Let's be people of action, right? If our faith is to bring victory in our lives and revival to the churches and have an impact in our world today, we must have a faith that acts. You see, to win this big war, you must not only be a person of vision and decision, and action for God, but also, and lastly, a person of devotion to God. We must be fully devoted to the Lord. This is so crucial. This last piece is so crucial, and is the chief point of this entire chapter of Hebrews 11, and this whole book, namely, that faith does not faint. Notice in verse 17, Abraham was tested. Moses persevered in verse 27. We are then told in chapter 12, 1, to run with perseverance what the race set before us. 
There is a race that is truly set before us. How are you competing in it? How are we acting in that race? And then Jesus has set forth as the supreme example who for, by the, who for the joy set before him in 12, chapter 12, verse 2, what did he do? He endured the cross. So consider him so you will not grow weary and lose heart. When the time gets tough, when the going gets tough, let's have a proper vision of God and remember Jesus Christ our Savior who was set before him, he did for us, he endured the cross for our sake. He died for our sins. He gave us eternal life. He paid the price for us and he wants us to follow him. So don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Keep the faith. Be in it to win. You with me? Life here can at times seem like an endurance test. Does life ever feel like that, poor soldier? When it starts feeling that way, fix your eyes on Jesus. But the way to endure is to do just that. In total devotion, fix your eyes on the Lord, not for what he can do for you, but what you can do for him. As we saw last week in the miracle of the nobleman's son. The chief characteristic of faith is that faith endures. Faith and hope as have as their base love. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? Love. Love. Faith says, I know God exists, 11.3. By faith, we understand it says that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. He created me. He created you. He called me. If you're a believer today, he called you. He loves me. He loves you. He died for me. He died for you. And will one day reward me, no matter what the circumstances in my life, no matter what those circumstances say to me, and no matter what my senses profess to me. Do you see the difference? He loves me, and we should love him. And that will enable me to endure. Look at verses 36 through 38. Some face jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. I don't know about you, but I, I, I just haven't experienced that yet, right? Multitudes suffered. Multitudes died, experiencing no great victories at all, as the world deems victories, as the world defines what victories are. The world would say, you're a loser. If you were sold in two, you're the loser. If you were killed by the sword, you're the loser. If you were flogged and imprisoned and enchained for Jesus Christ, you're the loser. Yet the word says, the world was not worthy of them, in verse 38. But here they are in God's hall of fame, having won the big war for having endured with faith. And Ephesians 4.1 tells us, Paul exhorted the Ephesians and us to live a life worthy of your calling. Here the world was not worthy of them, but they were in, uh, lived a life worthy of God and what pleased him. And here they are in his hall of fame. And we're called to do the same thing by living a life worthy of the very same calling in our life. And you see, the key is that the world's opinion of victory is not the Lord's opinion of victory. Remember that. The world's opinion of victory and success is not the same as the Lord's. These faith heroes lived worthy to their calling, and the world was not worthy of them. And the faith of these in Hebrews 11 worked spectacularly for some. They did big things for the Lord as recorded. And it also, the same faith, worked very quietly for others. But it was all the same faith rooted in the same Lord, Jesus Christ. Enoch was translated out of this world. Noah took the ark through the floodwaters upon the world. And others were put to death by the world. Yet it was glory for all as God planned. What in verse 40, 
something better to come. Do you all believe something better is coming? Amen to that. You may do no more than plant seed and water all your life while others come and reap all your hard work. So be it. That's of the Lord. But whether publicly or whether privately, whether quietly or whether spectacularly, faith endures fueled by the devotion to God. It's fueled by this devotion to our Savior through the strength of the Holy Spirit. And we look only for Jesus Christ's approval until one day we must meet him and say, well done. Don't look for any approval of man except for Jesus Christ in your life, and you'll do well. Winning the big war, victory in overcoming the downward pole of this world, this world's allurements, it's growing movement that's going away from God, it's constant pressure to conform us and mold us and twist us and turn us, the troubles and trials of this life, and the persecutions that come for the gospel's sake. It is all won by faith that consists of vision of God, the proper vision. The right decision on a daily basis, making it eternally minded. With action for the Lord, coming from a deep heart flowing of devotion. It is won by faith that consists of vision, decision, action, and devotion. So let's put it all together. Your vision will determine your decisions. Your decisions will dictate your actions. And your actions will ultimately reveal and ultimately demonstrate your devotion and show where your heart is. Because there's the key. It all stems from the heart. Charles Swindoll in his book, Encourage Me, tells of an instance during the reign of Oliver Cromwell. The British government ran low on silver to make coins. Cromwell sent his troops to the cathedrals to look for more precious metal. They needed more money. They needed more. Get, get, go get me some metal. I need silver and gold. The troops sent back this word. The only silver we could find is in the statues of the saints standing in the corners. Cromwell replied, good. We will melt down the saints and put them into circulation. <laughs> Swindoll goes on to say, isn't that the goal of authentic Christianity, we should be in circulation. Not rows of the saints lined up in cathedrals looking pretty, but real Christians in circulation coming out of the corners and hitting the world, living their faith in the shops, living their faith in the schools, in the factories, in the workplaces, in the offices. And most importantly, I believe it with my whole heart. You must live your faith in the home. You have. You have to live it in the home. Do you guys agree with that? Vision. Are you rejoicing in the reality of your faith and claiming the promises of God? If you're struggling there, get with the Lord. Reclaim those. Decisions. Do you weigh all your decisions against the light of eternity? Will you decide to live for Christ? Will you decide to live your faith? Will you decide to take that stand and speak up for Jesus Christ? Will you decide in your life? Remember, Joshua, as for me and my house, will you decide to live righteously in your life? And action, what are you going to do about it? When are you going to start? Many of you are doing so much here. And I'm talking about the whole church, the universal church. I look at my life. Am I doing everything I can in my life to serve Jesus Christ? And the answer is no. Because if I was, I'd be sinless. If I was, I wouldn't need a Savior, now would I? But I can be challenged, and I can challenge myself through the Holy Spirit to please Christ more. What am I going to do? And when am I going to do it? What am I going to do now to put my faith in action? Please ask yourself that in your life. And devotion Ask yourself, where is my heart? Am I just muddling through, or is my heart devoted completely to the Lord? Am I devoted to pleasing Him and doing His will, no matter what in my life? Is He pleased with me? That's what I want to ask myself. And in my sinful moments, that's not what I'm asking myself, is it? In my sinful moments, when I fail, that's not on 
my heart. But praise God for the Holy Spirit. When we fail in any of these areas, and praise God for the love of Jesus Christ, He's faithful and just to forgive me my sins. I can't see y'all. Y'all blurry. I can hear y'all, though, but I didn't hear anything. All right. I busted my glasses up a gaze yesterday, so I pulled these out of the drawer. I see everything here, and y'all are blurry. But that's okay. I know you're there. You know, as we celebrate our nation's fallen heroes, as we celebrate our freedom, the amazing thing is that we, unlike so many other countries, have the freedom to serve Jesus Christ because of the sacrifice of so many. Praise God for that, right? And more amazingly, we have been called to a higher honor and we've been called to a higher duty thanks to the love and thanks to the sacrifice of the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, with the ability to rise to this calling that's called to us through the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling in our lives. Praise God for that. And you know, there is a war. And it is still raging that is more significant. It has more internal impact than all the wars of the world, the past, present, and future. And it is fought. This battle, it is fought with the Lord's army. It is fought with the Christian soldier. The Lord's army. Through his strength, not mine. Through his will, not mine. And that is you. And that is me. This war is not, though, this is where the difference is. This war is not fought in one with bombs, guns, bullets, ships, aircraft, subs, missiles, and the like. It's fought with prayer. It's fought with God's word, with proper vision, with good decisions, with right actions, with full devotion, with an eternal mindset willing to serve our Lord. And it's all wrapped up into the greatest weapon that we have. And that is love. That's how we fight our war. Love the Lord. Love the saints. And love the lost. May we all strive with heartfelt desire to please and serve Jesus with 100% of our mind, body, and soul as we get the proper perspective of who we are and who we serve and what's called of us. May we all strive to do this. May we all be in it to win it. An attitude and an action that I guarantee you that the Lord will award you his medal of honor one day as you too will be a faith hero. Amen? Amen. All right. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we have your word to challenge us and to encourage us to live a life that wants to please you and has the ability and the strength and the power through your spirit to do it. Lord, I ask you to check our minds, to check our hearts, to check our actions. Let us take stock in them. Let us have a proper vision of you. Lord, let us have a proper action, proper devotion. Lord, I just pray that no matter what, that we serve you with our whole heart because we love you and that we love each other. Thank you for your Holy Spirit indwelling us. We leave everything up to you, Lord, and the results. May it only be to please you. Lord, let us surrender every aspect of our life to you. And on this weekend, as we look at all the fallen heroes that have served this nation, Lord, you rise nations up, you bring them down. You raise leaders up, you bring them down. We pray for our country today. We pray for its spiritual health. We pray, Lord, that they come to a knowledge of you as the truth, the only way and the only life. Lord, I pray you'll use us as instruments in this big war of eternity and hell, that you'll use us as you would see fit, whether spectacularly or quietly. Let us be faithful to you in all we say, all we do, all we think, and how we act. In your precious name, Jesus Christ, amen.